Elon, of course, represents the commercialization racket, and she will be joined by Lars. Lars, please welcome back. You, you heard him. You know him. A round of Good applause. Thank you. You've seen this man also before here today. He's the managing partner at Bepamu, uh, Bernhard Munzik. Bernhard, where are you? There you are. We wish to see you on the stage. Next up, Simon Kwiatkowski, investment manager at EIT Inno Energy. A round of applause to Simon. And last but not least, Lars Bonish, venture capitalist at Evonik Venture Capital. Round of applause. Hey, nice to meet you. Ilona, take it away. Thank you, thank you. That's this one? This one? Oops. Where do you want no, to sit? No, this, is this way, yeah. Uh, well, welcome everyone to this uh, very interesting uh, panel discussion, to my point of view at least. And um, I fully agree with you, Lars, that you mentioned that VC work is something about responsibility. It's not just about driving a Ferrari, like you said. And uh, today we're going to focus not just on what VC is and CVCs are actually uh, providing as capital money for startups, but also some value. Uh, I'm sure you would agree that uh, each of the investors is bringing something into play when starting investing into deep tech startups. And uh, my first question to the distinguished panelist would be, what kind of value creating activities you see are the most important uh, that are uh, VCs and CVCs bringing? So let's start with you, Shimon. Hey, thank you, Irona. Uh, first of all, Ras, thank you very much for this inspiring presentation. I think uh, there, are lot to, there are a lot of conclusions that, 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 yeah, that, that we uh, all need to take to, uh, into account. Uh, and Ilona answering your question, so, so basically I think it, um, the, the most important uh, you know, follow-up question to that is uh, who we are talking about. So, because I think uh, it varies uh, mostly if, it, if we are talking about corporate VC or regular generic VC, what is the stage? Uh, I think um, that changes a lot within the, uh, the growth of the company itself. Uh, from my perspective, uh, as an investor in the uh, clean tech and energy space, uh, I see the most value coming from that um, particular experience and, and track record and, and, and the connections, the network in the particular space uh, the investor is investing in. So, of course, we can speak of some kind of you know, generic smart money coming with uh, generalistic VC, uh, like you know, the, the whole network, the, um, the access to other investors, and so on. Uh, but we would like to f uh, focus more on actually um, s supporting the companies with business development, with uh, giving the access to new customers, um, funding both from private and public sources, and uh, supporting the whole product and technology development just because we are entering uh, at early stage. But it, of course, it's different depending on what investor we are talking about. And I'm sure that startups value this a lot, yeah, because this is something that, that they're really seeking for. And uh, they very often are just running around in the market seeking for customers, uh, relevant investors, relevant advisors. So this is something that you as uh, you know, energy are providing to them. Yes, exactly. That's what we uh, are trying to focus on, and um, I think we, uh, in the past, in the past uh, 11 years of activity, we actually delivered uh, what we uh, are, are talking about uh, currently. And I think you know, it's it's always difficult, you know, to to um, to give actual evidence of of doing that because this is kind of a promise that we are making. But but I think that the best way. To, to validate that is just to talk to the companies that we invested in the past and you know, get that evidence directly from them. Mm -hmm. Lars, over to you maybe. Uh, how you see it from the CVC perspective? What's uh, the value creation mechanism could be? Yeah, thanks first. Thanks for having me. And uh, the way I see it is um, I'm, I'm coming from, from Evonik Venture Capital, the, the venture arm of Evonik Industry, specialty chemical company. So we are pure strategic investor. And uh, for us, always, I mean, we, when we talk about it, for us, it's always smart money. Yeah? I mean, 
money can be provided by everyone, literally saying. So what we are offering, of, of, of course, it's, uh, it's things like access to, to networks. You know, we can help the startups in, in operational issues. We can help them on strategic questions. Everything which is related really to you know, the core technology. And, and, that's, and that's important for me, um, yeah, in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Bernhard, over to you. You're coming from a very specific area of expertise, but you're an investor as well. What's your take on that? Uh, so I'm a very early seed investor, so trying to get the plant growing. And I think uh, one of the big things I can bring in, or s people being in that uh, seed investment, is build an eco uh, basically an uh, ecosystem around this company, or around these companies, trying to make, to make it, like he said just a few minutes ago, really build something on a strategic base, must be not the same company, but build an ecosystem from the raw material till the end user at the end. And try to help that, to un that the, the people understand how this ecosystem is working, what are the requirements coming from different angles so that they are, can focus in a way that they don't burn money unnecessarily. And this helps also to attract, at the end, the big investors taking it up to higher levels. Yeah. And also, what he said, we have pensions funds yeah, in Europe, quite a lot of them. Yeah. And then you talk about patient. It will not happen within a few years. It takes 10, 15, 20 years until really something is, is growing. And there will, of course, a certain point of view when people say, yes, I have done a lot of work, and now a bigger one comes, and I'm willing basically to step back and start again the journey with the very small ones. This is also a model you can, can follow with. But basically, you need to have patience, you need to build an ecosystem around it, and that's what the investors should bring into this strategic thinking also to these companies, that they are not only focusing on a very specific, that they're really looking from the raw material till the end, and if you think in recycle in sustainability, also what is happening, if the end of life of the product is happening, is there again an opportunity to make the circle around? Fully, fully agree with you. Lars, your take on this? Well, Any specific examples on value creation activities from VCs or CVCs? I, I, so if we're dealing with like, like an emerging technology, I think what most of these companies need is an annoying customer. Uh, by an annoying customer, I mean a customer that is, for example, on a very developed market. And that annoying customer will actually be the pull function of that company in, at the everyday to figure out what they can do. Because many of them spend so enormous amount of hours figuring out even what the market looks like. So one of the key things that I'm really interested in, if you look at it from a European perspective, is like what are some of our current strengths in Europe is that we have great industries, right? We also have great industry families, by the way, okay. right? That can actually go into this. And if you see a lot of the very successful deep tech companies that we have in Europe, some of the first investors were actually family offices. And that's a different matter because they actually have the patient capital. I would like some of those uh, corporations and some of the CVCs that are part of that to have that exactly that perspective of an industry. So what they're investing into is an industrialization you say building an ecosystem. It's kind of the same way. I'm trying to say it with the sort of, you, how would you say it in the 90s? Yes. Right? Because what we're actually seeing right now is a revival of the industrial policy of the 90s, right? You walk around, people like to talk about reindustrialization because what we're seeing is that you're not just optimizing within an existing market. You're actually trying to create new markets. And that's why you need that more of a holistic perspective uh, uh, on it. So. What I'm asking the large corporations to be is to be a very committed, annoying customer with an underlying of a customer. You actually need to start buying something and buying something that is uh, sometimes at the prototype level. Um, and I think this could be done simply also because we don't have the mechanisms of the other transaction agreements, or, or sorry, authority that they have in the US, which is the widespread ability of 
of the US, all of the ministries and departments to actually buy early stage prototype development. We don't have that widespread in Europe, so there is a responsibility of the large corporations to actually be the advanced early stage buyer and then, and then take part. I think it comes out of a taking a responsibility right now, and I think we need to, to, uh, to see that. Lars, any reflections on that? No, I mean, he's right. And, and I can truly say we do that partially. Yeah. But, you know, buying products from, from uh, startups or, you know, our investments is not always the ultimate goal. So it is one of the goals, and we do that, and, and I agree. Um, there is a certain responsibility of, of also, you know, CVCs in the market to help these kind of startups, um, to grow them. And, you know, what, the, what I very much liked, uh, what you stated before, to, to be patient. You know, to have the willingness and the ability to stay in such a company for a longer period than maybe five years, mm -hmm. what the average holding period of a VC is, uh, to make sure that the, such a company can develop. Because if you look at, you know, deep tech, chemical, whatsoever, product to, product to market time can easily be eight to ten years. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the normal lifetime of a VC fund, which is 10 years, or basically five years investing period and then five, five years of, of, of divesting period, it usually doesn't fit. Right. So, yeah. Zach? Well, but do you think that all of the startups are perceptive of, let's say, what VCs are trying to bring them? Let's say maybe you can think of a good and bad example of... Uh, when the value creation was a good match for a startup and when it was a bad match. Because uh, we sometimes uh, meet startups which are kind of not coachable, that are not actually accepting some ideas that are coming from uh, investors. Maybe you have some examples that you can share with the audience, some practical ones. I mean, I can go first. I mean, just as an example, I mean, I consider myself to be kind of a let's say, mediator between our corporate and our startup world. Because if you want to really leverage, you know, the benefits which we are providing and what the startup can bring, this really, in, you know, this requires someone in the middle. Because the startup wants to move fast, you know, the corporate says, okay, let's, let's have a look first. And you need to have someone in the middle, somehow translating exactly what the other side wants from each other. And um, this can go actually, in, if you do it, it can go pretty good. But I have to admit, you know, sometimes, you know, expectations are not going in the same direction and then the result can be frustration. And that's something what, what, what we, I especially, want, want to prevent. Shimon, any examples from you? Uh, I think it's really important, you know, to, 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 to know the consequence of onboarding a particular investor. So, for example, talking about CVCs, uh, maybe sometimes it's too, too early to onboard such an investor. Uh, so, so having kind of awareness by the startup of onboarding a particular one and the consequences of it, I think it's crucial. Why, for example, uh, we stumbled upon a few situations where a particular CVC from the industry was already um, in the cap table uh, and kind of mm, uh, pre pre preventing uh, generic financial VCs uh, entering the company later on because of the uh, some kind of freight of uh, uh, the corporate partner being, you know, the main off taker, uh, preventing uh, from, from buy, buy, buying the product from competitive uh, corporates, and and kind of stealing this advantage that that, that was raised by the CVC. So, uh, so speaking of that. Uh, mm, of those expectations of, 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 of the company um, and the potential conflict on, on that. I think it's, it's mostly based on that um, education and, and kind of experience uh, from the early stage investors that, that actually guide a little bit the startup uh, to, uh, to show the path uh, and the uh, sequential what kind of investor we should onboard during the next stages. Mm -hmm. To my opinion, some kind of education and guidance sometimes is needed on both sides, yeah, because uh, uh, corporate institutions also have their, their own mentality, their own processes, and like Lars said, the mediation is needed there, and in one organization it's better, in, in another organization it's worse. So it's, it's kind of something that uh, we are still going through as an experience curve, I believe. Yeah. 
Uh, Bernhard, uh, over to you then. Uh, you have invested in uh, deep tech startups. Uh, maybe you can think of some examples where, uh, let's say, your advice and, and your activities as a value creator were well perceived or maybe badly perceived. I would like to take up the word patient again because you, you have people mostly coming from science, having a certain way to think, and a certain focus. And you should not be frustrated if the first time you give an advice is not accepted. Because it's a learning process, as you said, for both sides. And the better you know the people, the better you can give them a hint. You can open their eyes, for example. Say, okay, yes, we have to think about that. Or you can ask silly questions. Yeah? Uh, and then, of course, it's also part of trust. You have people with a certain history, and if you trust them, it will work. If there starts to be a mistrust, then it's ending up sooner or later in a, a kind of disaster or a separation. So we talk about people. Yes, they have a product behind, they have an idea, they have a vision, but you deal with people, and you have to treat them right, that you get the right result out of it. It does not help if you pressure them to have a certain uh, turnover at a certain time. You need to guide them, say, okay, yes, we know it's difficult. Look for a big, look for a big company as an early bird um, buyer or something like that, independent from the problematic you have with the big corporations because they have their own rules, or look at it a little bit differently, but you need to be patient. Because these young people coming from science, having made a PhD and have done a great invention, they need to learn that they are not alone on the earth and that there are a lot of competitive solutions available already. And then the question is how it fits, how you can build up the ecosystem, with whom you can connect best, and all these questions. So you need also to be patient with these people. You should not throw it, ah, okay, it does not work. You need to be patient. It's a training and coaching for both sides. And at the end, it might work. And there, of course, are decisions where I say, okay, now we're running out of money. We don't find somebody. We have to close it. It's hard for everybody. This can happen too. Yeah. That's very true. Uh, Lars, what about you? Sharing some experiences. I, I, I think, you know, you just need to just simply accept, and maybe this comes counterintuitive, that venture capital is a people's business and not a financial instrument only. And I think if we sort of separate out the part of venture capital that is a financial instrument, let's just not talk about that, but let's talk about the part that actually wants to be very involved pre-investment, but also obviously post-investment. Uh, I like funds that are what I call hyperactive, in their, in their post-investment and really working with the founders and looking at them at that. And it's, in that sense, a people's business. And it's really about, you know, you probably know, you know an enormous amount about these people. You know, if a divorce is coming up. You know, if they hate their co-founder. You know, if one of their children is not doing well. Right. Right? Everything is on the table because it is for many of these people, you know, there is no separation between that startup uh, and their life. It is, for some of them, their life. And I think you need to enjoy that part of it as well. It's probably also if somebody's been in a managerial role, you figure out you know, whether it gives you energy if you actually like that type of, 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 of interaction. And if you have the capacities to, to make the tough calls also when you, when, you, when you need to. So I think we just need to maybe also look at adventure capital. Maybe I'm just stating the obvious, but that the part of the time that you spend as a venture capitalist, as a fund manager, should maybe be more outside of the office and away from the spreadsheets and more with the founders and connecting them with people. Uh, uh, and I'm pretty sure that, that the people that are on this panel is what they do, but there's a lot of people that's not how it works uh, at, at the end of the day. And I think that's, that's just important to say, at least. Yes, people and, business. and this goes back to the idea of the responsibility of the VCs and the CVCs uh, regarding what they are doing with the funding and uh, with other activities. Um, this brings me to another question. We talk a lot that uh, there is a lack of funding for deep tech in Europe, especially for early stages. 
do you think that um, something is changing? Changing because we see still that uh, VCs are reluctant to invest uh, before they see, let's say, a marketable product or before they see uh, sales started, uh, clients waiting. Uh, uh, do you see this trend changes? Maybe, Lars, we start with you. No, I actually, I, as I said just right in the beginning of my short sort of talk there, is that I think we are in globally, sort of in Europe at least, are moving outside of the problem with the early stage funding. I think it was sifted that presented some days ago that now there's actually more investment into sort of so-called deep tech than if you look into sort of, you know, software as a service and et cetera, et cetera. So the world has changed over the last years for, 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 for the better. Uh, I, I, I do believe in that. I, so that then, my point was, it doesn't solve the problem, right? We then need to actually figure out how we then so get the growth equity there. Uh, and uh, um, that's why I highlight, you know, I think we need, you know, I don't believe that you can, I, I do believe that the only thing that, that can change venture capital is that if you change the LPs, because they set the conditions at the end of the day. So it's by, you know, stop, yelling at the fund managers and start yelling at the LPs, okay? So that's where I think, and for them, you actually sometimes need to y yell at the regulators because they also put boundaries on some of the LPs, but then we get into pension funds and Basel rules, but that's a different conversation. But I think that's, that's how we can solve the problem. So I would rather, I think we've solved the problem of early stage. If we are to talk about early stage, I think we need to think about how we set up our national grant system, so we start in a much larger degree accept uh, heretical ideas. There is a complacency in the system around Europe in terms of how you evaluate a lot of projects. So I think we need to change the quality of the pipeline because now the money I think is actually there. So I would rather see better quality in the pipeline and that comes by actually looking into the grant systems. So even before they to get to the equity stage. But, yeah. I definitely agree with you, and uh, I also do believe that very early stage uh, has capital uh, out there. Maybe there is a problem with uh, scale-up stage, because uh, there is not enough uh, capital, and a lot of startups uh, just stop developing at this stage, and this is a huge problem for Euro. But still, comparing to US, uh, there is a huge uh, discrepancy in funding levels, uh, uh, specifically for deep tech. Uh, I Can I just quickly respond to that? Yeah, sure. Because I think where you're going is then we need to get on par with the US. The fundamental hypothesis around that is that we can compete on par with the US. We cannot. We need to do something different. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? Okay. So otherwise, you're once again just optimizing the system, right? So we need different types of money where we are for the first time actually leveraging on our own strengths, which is our foundations, our industry family offices, because most of the family offices in Europe are actually industry families that we're talking about. So they are prone to to engage in this. So let's get them started because then we can actually start competing. Okay. It's not by being on par with the US. They'll still be very... Attractive. No, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, <laughs> this is the way to go forward. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lars, what's your take on this? Um, <laughs> what should I say? I mean, Lars is right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it's not as easy. No. Uh, you know, changing the world... Um, I mean, I can truly say we, we, we invest in, you know, in exactly the stages wh wh where you said, I mean, there it seems to be kind of a lack of funding. Um, you know, from the discussion we had when we look at companies to invest in, you know, it goes back to the previous statements that sometimes other investors, you know, they shy away because of the, of the product to market um, time. You know, they don't understand really the technology well. They cannot assess the technology maybe. Yeah? If you have a financial VC, um, it often happens that they say, we simply cannot assess a chemical company, for instance. So it goes back to education, it goes back to patience, maybe it also goes back to the point that we have to somehow increase, you know, the collaboration, I don't know how it is in the US, but maybe here in Europe, increase the collaboration really between the academia and the industry in a way that we can really bridge the most critical phase of the company where you start with the research until the commercial, com commercialization phase, so that we can somehow you know, find mechanism exactly to make sure that finally the startup is investable. Um, and we have to do something, I agree. I mean, 
one company alone cannot change the world, and um, if we have more investors who are willing to take the risk, um, then it's it, then it, perfect. I believe it's something about creating synergies between different types of players going together into the rounds, yeah, because yeah. Uh, let's say if someone is lacking certain knowledge or a certain expertise, then it can be backed up by another one. But there should be a, a trust built between the partners that uh, partners can rely on each other in certain things. Yeah, so. yeah but the, the, the problem here is still, for, for some of the investors, if you, if you look at the deep tech company and if you know that you know, product to market can be eight years, for most of the investors, it's not investable because, because of the time horizon. I mean, if I'm not wrong, MIT is the only real university which has the first long time VC fund of around 20 years, 17 years. I haven't seen the something. The engine, like MIT, the engine? Is exactly. That? Yeah. I haven't seen something like this in, this in Europe. I mean, you were referring to the pension funds, but we, we could also set up VC funds with a duration of 20 years in, in order to exactly finance these kind of companies. We don't have that yet. Um, that's where we have to learn from. Yeah. For sure. And, and one of the key things there, just to, to get into it, to, well, you prompted me a little bit with, by, by pointing to the engine because it's a very interesting setup that they have, right? They, you know, it's obviously MIT's behind it. It's the endowment of MIT, so it's, you know, separation of the, the legal setup and all that. But I think what is interesting is uh, what they have done is that most of the, uh, of the investments obviously get a seamless access to the laboratories of Harvard and MIT and all that. And I'm just asking the question to Europe here or just to this country, could that be possible? Why don't we have a, a seamless access to an internal market of research infrastructure in Europe when you get an investment? You know, I'm a representative also of the board of the Euro European Innovation Council. Like, how weird is it that we can't figure that one out? That if I'm a quantum startup and I get money from the EIC, of course with that comes a more seamless access at a flat fee access to the Nilsborg Institute of Copenhagen, of course. Mm -hmm. Those things we should just get in place so that we can do that. And then at the end of the day for deep tech, and you're pointing to that problem, and I do hope that when the NATO funds get, the NATO Innovation Fund gets you know, set up, and really starts working, is that we need those investors that can be the lead investor that can do the thorough technological due diligence on this because it is a key problem for many of these areas because you don't have a setup where you can actually understand whether you know they're bending the laws of gravity. So the ability to be a lead investor in you know, deep tech, and I think we need more of those to, to be able to do so, but this was a remark also to some of the universities to take a completely different type of responsibility, yes. right? To actually see if they can, they can do this. Yeah. Yes, recently uh, inside I, I, yeah. one, one remark to that university connections. I think uh, if you take a look how university equipment is there, how, how the buildings look like, I think this is something which the government, the government authorities need to do a lot to really have the right environment from a lab point of view and stuff like that, that it's really going. So that there is a lack also on that, which is significant. Some university starts to do that. They have found ways to get that financed. But if you go into the university and have a meeting there, you think, okay, I'm, I'm 20 years back. Yeah? But, you know, they, this, this, su the substance is not there. From a building, from an equipment point of view, and if you talk about chemistry and chemicals, there are certain other things which need to take into account. This is not really there. Yeah? If you would like, okay, you can render lab, but how it's equipped, how good is it equipped, that you really can do something. Mm. I think a good example is now what the British government has done with the Graphene Engineering and Innovation Center. They have built a brand new building with everything. It's okay. government funded, and now startups can rent rooms, can rent labs. This is something which is really great. And there is an ecosystem starting to grow around that. We have some things like that a little bit with Fraunhofer, but only a little bit. But that's it. Yeah? And I think this is an example where you can do them, but the government then is in the lead. It's not an investor. It needs to be the foundation there. And then the investor can come and say, okay, 
now you have grown to a certain size, you need a new lab, I can offer you a lab in my facilities. That would be the next step. Hmm? But this is difficult because the, the basics is missing, simply. This actually, again, uh, reflects on uh, the synergies that are needed between different ecosystem players. I see that uh, we are running out of time and maybe just a quick round of uh, any uh, wishes that you have for startups uh, that are actually applying for investments uh, from your uh, funds or from uh, the funds that are around you. Maybe a quick, just 10, 15 seconds. Um. Well, yes, I'm always, you know, delighted by any approach from a startup um, with, you know, presentations, questions. The only wish I would have is, in order to respect everybody's resources, maybe take a couple of seconds to look at the company, you know, I'm working for uh, and what we are doing. Um, this could a actually easily answer uh, directly the most relevant question, whether a startup is potentially of interest to us. That's all I want to say here. That's Thanks. for sure. <laughs> Shimon? Uh, there's a lot of hustle about, about the, trend, uh, the market trends and, and funding going down and so on. Uh, but I just, my, my must would be don't feel discouraged, especially for early stage clean tech, which we're operating in, which actually getting bigger and bigger. Our investors are uh, interested in funding those companies, so, so don't feel discouraged and, and definitely uh, be ambitious about the funding, about the roadmaps, about the bringing solutions to the market that can actually impact yeah, the changing climate. Yeah. Thank you. Lars? Well, what I look for is, so in the labs of MIT, it's, they call it the kill experiment. So I want them to be able to explain to me, you know, not only that it could work, but also that it matters. Because there's an enormous amount of things out in the world that works, but doesn't really matter. So it's really about, you know, focusing on something that, okay, if we could do this, if there's something incredibly hard that can be achieved, and often that is very technical or technological, I want them to be able to actually convince me about that. So if we talk deep tech, I'm often actually more honed in on the science and that they are at the edge of a scientific paradigm because that's actually where the true novelty actually lies and not within, you know, an existing scientific paradigm. But well, that's just me. I Indeed, yeah. yeah. Bernhard? Well, uh, the wish I would have on, 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 on startups that uh, they take some time to look a little bit around and not focus so much on their own invention. Be open what is already existing. And then what you just said, try to evaluate whether we really have an edge on technology, on business models, whatever. Yeah. Because I think this is important to look around, not to say, yeah, that's great, yes, but you, what is the, with the competitive solutions? And do you solve something which is going beyond that? And what is, at the end, the need of the final customer? Very simple, but hard to detect, I know. That's true. Well, gentlemen, we had a very exciting uh, discussion today. I really enjoyed it. And I hope that we also managed to bring some value to the audience. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.